Can you believe it? A hundred and some thousand dollar Range Rover off-road and it's doing quite well. This segment we like to call everything you've ever wanted to know about the 2013 Range Rover. Coming up next on the Fast Lane Car. My name is Stuart Moore and I'm the uh, Chief Program Engineer for uh, Electrical Engineering. And we are sitting in the brand new 2013 Range Rover. So first of all, would you tell me what's new about it? What makes it better than the outgoing model? The uh, Probably the best thing on the car, and I would say this because I'm an electrical engineer, is actually the Meridian Sound System. The Meridian Sound system, system is absolutely uh, excellent. The top of the range one is actually a 29 speaker system, 1700 watts, and we're the first to market with the 3D uh, sound system. And to deliver that we've ended up having to put speakers in the headlining of the roof and in the um, backs of the front seats and that sort of, because surround sound is all around you but doesn't necessarily give you an awful lot of depth. The 3D sound system, because we've got speakers in the roof, that gives you the extra height in the in the sign stage as well um, so that's really cool we're really excited about that and we're really pleased with the way it's come out now we can't obviously demonstrate that because we have a little mic but I, I assume it would blow your ears off if we had it in this vehicle uh, or is it just is it just it's, deeper, it's, fuller? It's, not, it's just fuller it's not necessarily we haven't gone for just full out max power although it is you know it is pretty loud but it's not it's more about the dynamic response of the system that's what we use the power for rather than just straight out decibels now tell me about kind of the infotainment system and the kind of the cleanup you did with uh, the dashboard. There are a lot fewer buttons here. There's a lot less going on in the outgoing model. Yeah, I mean we have we've made a conscious effort to try and simplify the the center stack of the car. Um, we've brought in some new technology with the switches around the around the touchscreen because you know they're they're si silent um, or um, secret to lit. Yeah. Um, so you don't see them. Um, when the car is like this, it's only when you actually start the engine that you'll see those lit up um, and uh, they're touch sensitive as well. Um, so that helps simplify the whole center stack and then the bit further down with the climate control um, switchback, that's also been simplified uh, compared with the outgoing car. Um, obviously we've retained the rotary knobs for um, the uh, fan speed control and the temperature setting and then we've obviously stuck with the rotary shifter as well because that's 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 turned out to be a great bit of technology um, that we've do, that we're now deploying across the range um, so it's become kind of a signature for Jan, uh, Jaguar and Land Rover yeah I mean we had to we needed to come up with a new shifter strategy a few a few years ago and this concept um, clinic really well it was very intuitive people loved it um, and we've carried it over into into this car as well and then obviously we've, um, in this, this specific model, we've got the automatic terrain response system. You know, Land Rover invented terrain response back in 2004. Mm. And for 2013, we've enhanced it even further with an automatic mode where the car will detect, look at the sensor inputs, you know, wheel speed, slip, yaw rate, that sort of thing. And it will decide which one of the five settings is the optimum setting to allow you to progress through the terrain that you're driving in. So. And the idea behind that really is to actually allow even novice off-road drivers to benefit from the full capability of the car. They don't have to feel as if they're an expert, they don't have to feel as if they know which mode to put the car in to get them where they want to go. Yeah, I've always was kind of confused by that because there's a little mode where it has, for instance, a tree, so it's like forest, and there's a mode where you're in sand and there's a yeah. cactus. And so now the car actually senses and it can tell the difference between, say, you know, you're on boulders versus in sand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and it'll cool. automatically switch between it'll automatically switch between the modes. Uh, to help you progress the most efficient way it can. And what's happening with the software? I mean, so you're using, I take it, the car's stability control, you're braking yeah. certain wheels, kind of yeah. what's going on underneath? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the because we've got a, a leadership position in off-road capability, there's nobody else that does mm -hmm. that's as good as we are off-road. Things like the terrain response system and the active right roll control that we've got on the supercharged derivative and the air suspension system, that software is actually housed in what we call the scalable chassis controller, and we've designed that ourselves. Um, 
okay, we buy the hardware, you know, the PCB, right. in from a tier one supplier, but the software is actually all authored in-house um, by our guys back in the UK. We've actually got a team of 40 software engineers working on software. Writing code. Pure, yeah, writing code purely for um, those three or four features that, are, that, that sit in the scalable chassis controller. Wow. So, so how many parameters does it take into account? I mean, how does it, or is that a too technical of a it's question? Too, it's, yeah, too it's technical. Too technical. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a lot. It, it is a lot, um, and it monitors them, you know, hundreds of times a second, a second, and looks at then the um, there's a probability algorithm that tries to work out then what type of terrain you're on and what would be the best solution for for what you're doing, and then there's a mode manager that effectively manages the transition between one of the five modes. All right, let me ask oh, yeah. you an easier question then. How much height difference, what's the lowest setting, what's the highest setting in terms of inches? The standard setting yeah. is um, about 12 inches, it's 11.9 inches, okay. let's call it 12 inches. In uh, so that's the standard mode that we're in right now. Um, we can drop it down to access mode, which drops it down a further two inches, makes it easier for people to get sure. in and out of the car. If you're then in auto if you're in off-road mode, then it'll rise it up three inches above the standard setting. And then if the system has detected that you're at risk of grinding out because all four wheels are spinning at the same time. It'll rise it up a further one and a half inches. So 16 and a half? Am I doing the math right? Uh, well, I actually haven't finished yet. Okay. Because on top of that then, yeah. there is another um, manual extended mode that can lift it up a further one and a half inches. So from access mode all the way up to manual extended mode, you've basically got two inches plus three inches plus one and a half plus one and a half so 18 inches almost of ground yeah. clearance that's a lot yeah. and then and then you've got the wheel articulation on top of that you've got effectively two feet of wheel tra of potential wheel travel so when you add those two parameters together that gives the car a phenomenal off-road capability now obviously Range Rover has been known for being an off-road vehicle but there's also a lot of luxury appointments in here yeah. so it, it seems like it's more luxurious it seems like the materials are a little bit better and Perhaps the biggest story is the fact that it's a lot lighter. Can you tell yeah. me about that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, the car is now made out of aluminum. Yep. Um, compared with the outgoing model, this car is 700 pounds lighter than the outgoing model. That's really incredible. Which is pretty impressive. Most you know, cars are heavier. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, alum aluminum is great for two reasons. One is it's a lot lighter than steel. The other benefit is it's a lot more, it's a lot stronger, a lot more rigid than, than steel as well. So those two things coupled together to be able to take significant amount of weight out of the car but give it the dynamic platform um, that really sets it apart from any other luxury SUV in the world. Um, and does that make it more expensive? I mean, then you, because it's aluminum is expensive to make, it's expensive to bond, it's expensive to repair. Yeah, I mean, it is it is expensive, but I think, you know, you look at the you look at the selling price of the car in the showroom and you compare that to, you know, a Mercedes S-Class or a Mercedes GL wagon or something like that, and it's still an incredibly competitive offering. Yeah. So I take it you've driven these a lot now. What, yeah. What's your favorite part of the car? The, the um, driving dynamics, yeah. I'd have to say. I mean, although I'm an electrical engineer, so I love the audio system and mm. I love some of those features, the way the car handles on the road is absolutely brilliant. You feel so connected. The steering, because uh, it's an electronic power steering system now, is absolutely great. It gives you a lovely fit steering feel. You feel really connected with the way the car uh, is sweeping through the bends. The body roll is... is it's not completely eliminated, but it's, it's a lot of it's, it's a lot of wheel travel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, but it is it's um, it is well controlled now. So compared with certainly compared with the old Range Rover, you feel much more confident um, driving around, sweeping bends, and things like that. And um, one of the things you obviously did was also keep it very um, off road worthy. So. I saw a video that you showed last night where it went through three feet of water. Yeah. That must have been quite the challenge to be able to have the car do that as well. Yeah, I mean, the old Range Rover was none too shabby with, yeah, uh, with a weighting depth of 700 millimeters. But with this new car, we've actually, we've, we've really moved the benchmark on now. And this car is good to 900 millimeters, which is a three feet of water. Yeah, and you said one of the tests you do is you put it in a pond or a tank, yeah. and then you open the doors, you let it flood, and then the car's got to start. Yeah, yeah, and it's always it's always the last test we do on that specific car. Okay. Because obviously you've just filled the inside of the car with three feet of water, so it's not it's not going to be good for much else after that. But that's not. I mean, the important thing is actually if you ever find yourself in that situation, you've got the confidence to know that the car is actually going to be able to get you out again, so you're not going to be stranded in effectively three feet of water. So it's really really important. Um, 
that our customers have got the confidence in the product that that should give them. And how tricky was it? You can get this car in uh, a combination of 22 inch wheels, which are just, yeah. that, that's massive. I mean, those yeah. are, those are some, and how tricky is it to engineer a car that can uh, wear 22 inch rubber and at the same time go off road and at the same time go over what, 150 miles an hour, right? Is that yeah, the parameter? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 155, yeah. That must've been quite the trick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to be able to get all three of those things in one vehicle. Yeah. I mean, we are we are convinced that there is no other car or SUV like this in the world. That, yeah. That has got. I mean, we we use the term breadth of capability, um, but there is nothing else like it where you can do 155. Obviously, not necessarily on the freeway, but it is capable of doing 155. Um, you travel in absolute luxury and almost complete silence. And then you can go off road and you can go up mountains and you can do stuff that no other, you know, pretty much no other SUV can do. Now in America, the, the Range Rover has had some reliability issues. Have you addressed those as well? We have. I mean, we obviously understand that actually there's nothing more frustrating for an owner uh, than to have a problem with their car. Yeah. Um, and we've been targeting that fairly aggressively, um, not just for Range Rover, but for the entire product range. And um, one of the key things that we've managed to achieve in the last two years, we've actually reduced the, the warranty bill by 25% year on year. So, you know, compared with how the amount of money that we were spending on warranty um, three Issues. years ago, yeah. we're now, it now costs us 50% less. Now, that's still not good enough. You know, we're not, we're not complacent with that, and we're continuing to target um, improvements at every single step of the way. So you think this one, this fourth generation is, is more reliable, is more... Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. your time. Thanks. No problem. Yeah. That's great. Now, Range Rover thinks that the new 2013 model competes with cars like the BMW X5, of course, the Mercedes-Benz GL, and, believe it or not, the Rolls-Royce. Of course, the Rolls-Royce can't do that off-road, but then again, a Rolls-Royce probably is a little bit more luxurious on the inside even though the new Range Rover is very plush indeed. We really are only gonna scratch the surface of the features on the car, you'll experience most of it tomorrow. So I'll just take you through a little bit about the car and how it fits into the marketplace, first of all. Um, because of the breadth of capability of Range Rover, it is virtually impossible to find a competitor in the marketplace. You could point to one or two that might be competitive in this aspect or another aspect, but you're not gonna find one that can do it all. And that's the challenge when the engineers have to develop a new vehicle and the designers have to design a new vehicle. What do you target? How do you make it better? How do you make it better than somebody else? So what they do is look at the entire marketplace and find vehicles that excel at one aspect or another and they target that aspect. So you see cars up there like a Rolls Royce or a Bentley. And yes, that's what they've targeted. And that's for certain aspects of the product. And, and you'll experience that tomorrow. It lives up to that. How it fits into the marketplace from a size perspective, some people think Range Rover is a really big vehicle. It happens to be tall, but it is not a massive vehicle. It actually fits between a mid-sized German sedan and the short wheelbase, big <coughs> German sedan. So that's an Audi A6 silhouette you see on there. Uh, it's slightly shorter than the all new Range Rover, and the BMW 7 Series short wheelbase is actually longer than a Range Rover. Um, this car, we don't actually have a size-to-size -size comparison with the previous car, but it's about an inch to an inch and a half longer than the previous car, but it's still very tidally proportioned. And how it fits to probably the, the other big SUV in the marketplace that you might think of, the Mercedes GL, um, it's about five inches shorter than a GL. So it's actually a relatively compact exterior space, and you'll see on the inside we've, how we've improved the environment. We've got four models in the U.S. Uh, there's the Range Rover, the Range Rover HSE, both of those two with the naturally aspirated V8 engine, the supercharged, and then an autobiography. And if most of you are probably familiar with autobiography. That's pretty much all the way. Every option you can get, the nicest leathers, leather everywhere, all that kind of stuff. In Canada, uh, they've launched the vehicle with only two, the top two trim levels, the supercharged and the autobiography, both with the supercharged V8. Okay, and there will be pricing handed out to the Canadian journalists uh, Lindsay will have it, or uh, uh, Barb when she gets here. She's a little delayed. Panoramic roof, um, fantastic feature. Uh, you really appreciate that from the driver's seat, but more importantly, from the rear seat, where probably I'm going to be sitting behind you. So I'll really enjoy the view out the panoramic glass roof, but it, it actually does transform that environment. 
So not only, is it, not only is it more spacious in the rear, and I'll show you those dimensions shortly, but it really allows a sense of light and space in the back seat, and it just transforms that environment. So the front seat environment has always been fantastic in a Range Rover, and now the rear seat environment is just as good, so there's no bad seat in the house. We've added a power split tailgate. Both the upper and lower are powered. It remains the clamshell split. See it in the video there. It can be operated from the key fob, from the buttons on the tailgate, or actually there is a uh, switch in the lower fascia of the dashboard as well, so all three places you can operate it. And that lower tailgate can still support, um, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, it's, I want to say it's 600 pounds of weight, so two large people can easily sit on a tailgate for spectator sports, or you can actually stand on it if you want. So that rear seat occupant space, um, this particular picture is the executive class rear seating that's, that's available on Autobiography. That's new for Range Rover for this year. But the rear seat legroom is increased by four, four, almost five inches, 4.7 <coughs> inches, and two inches more knee, knee room in the back. So it really is a much more pleasant place to sit. This executive seating package has a, a whole bunch of features to it as well. So um, if you're driving a Range Rover Autobiography with that, you might find one of us hopping in the back with you because it really is a nice place to sit. This is a picture of that console that's in the back. You've got your own climate on either side, climate control, temperature, heated seats, cooled seats, massage, and the ability to move the passenger side front seat forward. So if somebody's not in that seat and you want more legroom, you can move it forward from the back as well. So it's a really nice environment. You may be familiar with our audio partner. We introduced Meridian as our new audio partner with Range Rover Revoke last year. There are three levels of audio system. There's a fantastic, clear, crisp, standard audio system from Meridian. There's a, a really nice surround sound system that will, I think you'll find is really great. You'll see that in most of the cars that you'll experience tomorrow. And then there's the super premium Meridian signature surround system. And it's a 3D surround system and it's the first application of surround system in an automotive environment. And you will, you will have, we have one car you can experience that, that has it. It's 1700 watts and 29 speakers. So first, first 3D application first 3D application. A, a competitor um, announced that they are going to introduce a 3D surround system just recently at CES, but they have not introduced it yet, and ours went on sale in December. Uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, the Meridian folks have not yet introduced that processing into their home systems. They've actually introduced it in our car first. When you get to this level of luxury, it's, it's a lot about choice and customization and personalization. These people want what they want, so we have to give it to them. And you can see some of the variety of interior colors. Um, you can switch the color of the <coughs> seats in and, in and out, dark or light, so you can see that. <coughs> some colors not to everyone's taste, <laughs> but to a few people's taste, and so we offer it for them. Um, we didn't mention, but you've probably seen in some of the pictures, the contrast roof that's now available, and that's, that's something very different on Range Rover, so Range Rovers traditionally have the floating roof, which is the body color, floats above the glass, and the body color <coughs> below. Now you can get a contrast roof in multiple colors, and you'll see that tomorrow as well. So again, more personalization, more choice for folks. There are eight wheels available, three of them 22-inch size. 22-inch wheels actually, we didn't, we didn't <coughs> have this up on the slide, but the 22-inch wheels actually raise the speed limit of the, uh, the maximum speed of the vehicle. To 155 miles an hour. Not that anyone should go 155 miles an hour tomorrow. There are lots of police out there, and Bob will warn you about that, but the vehicle can do that. So just think about that when you're going about two miles an hour off-road over crazy rocks, that that very same vehicle with a 22-inch wheel can go 155 miles an hour as well. So there's just tons and tons and tons of things. I, I literally could have had 50 slides on features in this car. But more importantly, just pay attention to some of the environment things, that, the personalization options, the quality of the craftsmanship, the detail, <coughs> the ambiance of the interior. That kind of is the summation of all of those features. But I think that the end result takeaway is that there really is no other vehicle like it on the marketplace.